Good afternoon. On behalf of PEGS Foundation and the Northeast Ohio Medical University Coordinating Centers of Excellence, we welcome you to the fourth Drs. Fred and Penny Freeze lecture, Community Building and Collaboration Among Students with Psychosis. The webinar will, be, will begin in just a few moments. Please welcome PEGS Foundation President, Mr. Rick Keller, who joins us with a video message. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. PEGS Foundation and the NEOMED Coordinating Centers of Excellence created this lecture series in 2018 to honor the late Dr. Fred Fries and his wife, Dr. Penny Fries. We wanted to have remarkable people like Fred, who lived, with, lived successfully with schizophrenia, and Penny, who supported her family members' recoveries, share their stories of hope and recovery. I would like to extend a special welcome to Dr. Penny Fries, one of my board members and trustees and trusted friends, who is part of our virtual audience today. Dr. Fred Fries had an amazing impact on people's perceptions about recovery from schizophrenia. He changed hearts and minds by being a living example of how people affected by schizophrenia can lead meaningful, independent lives in the community. He felt it was important to share his story publicly, and he was one of the first to do so in the nation. He, de he delivered more than 2,000 presentations and made countless media appearances sharing his story of, story of recovery from schizophrenia in an extraordinarily dynamic, warm, and humorous way. Fred wanted people to know that his recovery from schizophrenia was, as he often said, not all that unusual. He believed that with continual advances in medication, improved access to treatment, and compassionate support, recovery from schizophrenia and other serious mental illnesses should be the expectation and not the exception. He devoted much of his life advocating for the elimination of stigma and for access to evidence-based and promising treatment practices for mental illness. We honor his legacy through this lecture series. I would now like to introduce Ruth Samara, the Executive Director of the NeoMed Coordinating Centers of Excellence, who will be introducing today's speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, and good afternoon. It is an honor and a genuine pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Please welcome Cecilia McGow, the founder and executive director of Students with Psychosis. Cecilia is also a mental health advocate, media consultant, and former radio astronomer living with autism and schizophrenia. At the age of 17, Cecilia co-discovered a celestial object that emits regular pulses of radio waves along with other electromagnetic radiation. And the findings were published in the Astrophysics Journal. After making such an important discovery, she studied astronomy and astrophysics at Penn State University. Although Cecilia had experienced symptoms of schizophrenia throughout her life, she did not receive a formal diagnosis until her sophomore year of college. After receiving treatment and during her recovery journey, she decided to share her experiences and to help others facing similar situations. In 2017, she delivered a TEDx PSU talk aimed at reducing the stigma associated with schizophrenia. Cecilia's story has been viewed by more than 30 million times across multiple international platforms since that TEDx PSU talk. Cecilia also created Students with Psychosis, a global nonprofit which empowers individuals affected by psychosis through facilitated programming, meaningful engagement, and community building opportunities. Students with Psychosis provides more than 160 hours of a variety of daily virtual programming each month at no cost to its members. We are delighted that five Students with Psychosis team members join us today. Please welcome Dominique, who is the Students with Psychosis Internship Coordinator. A graduate of Pennsylvania State University with a master's degree in health services administration from Indiana University of Pennsylvania, Dominique wholeheartedly believes that psychosis is underrepresented in the mental health community and wants to help others amplify their voices and break the stigma of mental illness. 
I would also like to welcome Alice Antcliffe, Students with Psychosis Student Leader Coordinator. After a hospitalization that led to taking some time off from school and work, Alice developed new coping skills and a broader support network. She is studying psychology with a focus on mental health. Laura Kordowski, who served as a Students with Psychosis intern and is now a member of the executive board and the vice president for management, also joins us today. Laura received her Associate of Arts in Liberal Arts, Bachelor of Arts in History, and Master's in Library and Information Science while living with psychosis. She has experience working in human services and currently works in a public library. Her advocacy is shared through her photography on social media platforms, and she is also a writer. Please welcome Emeka Chima. Since joining students with psychosis in 2020, he has achieved several milestones, including serving as a member and the secretary of the executive board. Emeka is studying information systems management at the University of Maryland Global Campus. I would also like to welcome Ray, who also is an executive board member. He is president of Columbus State's Pride Club and has several other campus leadership positions. He is an artist and his work will soon be on display in community gardens. He hopes he can help better the lives of people living with disabilities, including but not limited to psychosis. Cecilia, Dominique, Alice, Laura, Emeka, and Ray, thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to your presentations. Thank you so much, Ruth, for that introduction. And thank you everyone for attending this lecture today. My name is Cecilia Miguel, and I was an astronomy and astrophysics major at Penn State University. In high school, I was lucky enough to co-discover a pulsar through the Pulsar Surgical Laboratory. A pulsar being a super dense neutron star that emits electromagnetic radiation. Think of a star much, much larger than our sun, exploding its outer layers and leaving behind a dense core. That core can be our pulsar. This discovery opened some doors for me, such as helping represent the United States in the International Space Olympics in Russia and being a Virginia Aerospace, a Virginia Aerospace Science and Technology Scholar through NASA Langley Research Center. But during this time, I had a secret, a secret that I was too scared and too embarrassed to tell anyone. And that secret is, well, I have schizophrenia. Well, what is schizophrenia? Well, schizophrenia is very much an umbrella-like diagnosis. Uh, but for me, uh, in, in this presentation, I'll be talking a bit about my personal lived experience. I am someone who sees, hears, and feels things that aren't there, and also experience a certain level of paranoia and delusions. My life changed drastically in February of my freshman year at college when I tried to take my own life. Why you might ask? Because my life had become a waking nightmare. Everywhere that I went, I started hallucinating a clown, a clown very similar to the older adaptation of Stephen King's It. And let me just say, I wasn't a good time when they made a remake and then a sequel. I heard the sequel wasn't so good, so I'm hoping that they won't make any other ones. But that's not the only hallucination uh, that I experienced. I also experienced other hallucinations such as spiders. Some of the most difficult for me to discern from real life is, well, small spiders, because we see spiders every single day, or at least uh, like we see them in our everyday life. And something that helps me with discerning whether or not a spider is real or not is taking my phone and taking a picture to seeing whether or not it's real. But I also hallucinate large spiders though as well. One comes into mind in particular, rather large, leathery skin. No voice would ever come, like no words would ever come out of its mouth, but the creaking of its legs would sound like young children laughing. It would be highly disturbing. This became unbearable for me though, when I started hallucinating a girl that was very similar to the movie, The Ring. 
even though I call this hallucination the girl, and you might notice that I don't give any names to my hallucinations, because for me, well, they don't deserve any names. Uh, actually, it's more of a middle-aged woman, but with the maturity of more of a younger age girl. And this girl was different than the clown or the spiders because, well, she would be able to continue conversations with herself and knew exactly what to say and when to say to chip away at my insecurities. Another hallucination that I started developing uh, later on uh, when I moved here to uh, New York City, I was unfortunately uh, standing at a subway uh, platform where someone unfortunately was hit and uh, uh, passed away from, uh, from the subway. And after that incident, I had another uh, really difficult episode and I started hallucinating a younger boy. I used to not speak so openly about my hallucinations when I was younger because, well, people would often look at me in fear. But I want everyone to know that we all see, hear, and feel things that aren't there when we're dreaming. That is no reason of to be scared of me. I remember it taking me a very long time to finally get that proper medical treatment. It took me eight months, eight months after my suicide attempt to go and see a doctor. And a lot of it was because of conversations I would have with my parents. I remember being on the phone with my mother saying, mom, I'm sick. I'm seeing, hearing things that aren't there. I need to go to the doctor. Her response, no, 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 no. You can't tell anyone about this. This can't be on our medical history. Think of your future. Think of your sister's future. People are going to think that you're crazy. People are going to think that you're dangerous and you won't be able to get a job. My response to that now is don't let anyone, including yourself, get in the way of getting that proper medical treatment. It is not only your choice, but it is also your right. I'm confident that I wouldn't be here today if I didn't get that proper medical help. However, I wasn't open about my schizophrenia after reaching out for help. I've been in uh, hospitalization six different times and I wasn't open about my diagnosis until the second one because the police were involved. Let me set up the scene a bit. The night before I was struggling with my mental health. So I decided to admit myself into the emergency room. I stayed there overnight and the doctor said it was okay for me to return back to my dorm room in the morning. But when I returned back to my dorm room, I was not only greeted by my roommates, but also the RA, the residential assistant, and a can't help person. We all talked and we decided that I would have another psych ward stay. And I was in no way refusing not to go. And I have no past history of violence. Actually, someone who has schizophrenia is more likely to be an abuse victim rather than an abuser. For example, I lived in a homeless abuse shelter for part of high school. So what happened next was really inexcusable. They brought police officers into my dorm room dorm in full uniform. They patted me down in front of my roommates and I had to convince them not to put handcuffs on me. They then escorted me into a marked police car that was parked right outside one of our dining commons where friends were passing by and seeing me put into this police car. By the time that I came back, the cat was out of the bag. People knew something was up and I had to set the story straight. So after that, I opened up about my schizophrenia on social media. I was actually surprised about how many other people reached out to me to say that they had schizophrenia. This is when I realized that this was an issue much larger than what happened with me or what was happening at Penn State. And this is when I went into psychosis advocacy. And I'm not gonna rest until there is one day that no one is afraid to say the words, I have schizophrenia or I have psychosis. Cause it's okay. It's okay to have schizophrenia. It's okay to have psychosis. 
This is why we founded the nonprofit Students with Psychosis. Students with Psychosis is a global nonprofit focused on empowering college students and advocates worldwide through community building and collaboration. In the rest of today's lecture, you'll be hearing from some of our other team members. Next up, we'll be hearing from our executive board member, Ray, who will be sharing a bit about their experience uh, living with psychosis and joining SWP. It is my pleasure to introduce Ray. Ray, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ray. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a 23-year-old college student studying social work at Columbus State Community College. I plan to transfer to Ohio State University in the fall, and I eventually want to become a recreational therapist and work in an inpatient hospital setting. I started college in the fall of 2019. I took several years of break after high school before I made this decision because when I was in high school, I struggled to even pass my classes due to my disabilities impacting me so severely. I have multiple disabilities, but the one that's relevant to this conversation is that I have schizoaffective disorder, depressive type. In addition to being a minority, I am a first gen college student and neither of my older siblings have attended college either, which led to me feeling very alone and confused throughout the process. I found that on my campus, there were no clubs or organizations for people who have psychosis. The One General Mental Health Club unfortunately disbanded due to COVID when students needed support the most. The social work program was also very isolating to me as a person who has disabilities and I've struggled to make any close connections with others at my college. At one point during this experience, I ended up doing some research into psychosis to hopefully find people that I could relate to. I stumbled across Cecilia's TED Talk, and from there I found students with psychosis, and I immediately knew that I wanted to join. There is a lack of psychosis-specific support in my area, and the support that is there is not all-inclusive. When I sought professional help, unfortunately I encountered stigma and mistreatment at first. This led to me feeling very isolated. So when I joined students with psychosis, I found a community of people that I could relate to and connect with. I found a safe space to talk about psychosis and my mental health where others would be understanding rather than dismissive or insulting. I ended up joining the executive board and my opportunities only expanded from there. The community and the support that students with psychosis provides is something that many have not been able to find elsewhere. I know that I personally have it. While I have since found professional support that understands and respects me, and I believe that that's essential to my journey, I find that the peer support through students with psychosis has helped me heal greatly. I'm very grateful to be involved with students with psychosis, and I'm glad I've met so many amazing people through it. I believe wholeheartedly in the work that we do, and I'm excited to see how students with psychosis can inspire change across the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ray, for those powerful words and sharing some of your experience with us today. Next up, we have our intern coordinator, Dominique. Dominique, take it away. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Cecilia, for the introduction. A little bit about me. I have been with students with psychosis for a little over a year. I joined Students with Psychosis during the onset of the pandemic and learned how resilient and adaptable students could be, especially despite a condition society labels as severely impaired. I started off as an intern seeking others that I could relate to. A part of my treatment plan is going to group therapy. Over the years, I never found someone with psychosis. I felt alone. However, I discovered that at SWP. I gained confidence in my ability to amplify my voice, leadership skills, and inspiration and insight from a community of those I believe have colorful minds. Being with students with similar experiences as me at first was a shocker. 
but it gave me lasting confidence and agreement that the illness would not hold me back. I did much meaningful work in my role as an intern and gained a wonderful community. Luckily, after a few months, I advanced to internship coordinator. I used my leadership role to empower other students and prospective students to have the same experience as I did. That optimism, hope, and connection grew. This is what helped my recovery. So about students with psychosis, well, our community is quite unique. The programs we offer here are 100% powered by those with lived experience. Yes, we particularly cater to the student population for the reason that by average, psychosis appears during the onset of adulthood, typically before the age of 24. This source is from the World of Psychiatry Journal. Well, adulthood falls under the college years, early adulthood, and many of the students experience their first break of psychosis during college, which I did. So we support students to continue and empower them to advocate for themselves in either academia or the workplace. We see a world that, adopt, that adapts to those with disabilities rather than isolate us by complacency and confusion. Our programs fulfill, the, fulfill to meet the needs of our community. We stimulate discussion around worldwide intersectional issues and offer peer support to inspire students to keep going. Some of the ways we do this is by cultivating an inclusive environment that everyone feels welcomed. Allow accommodation and sensitivity to health and well being, and give student leaders the ability to lead discussions around our insight into treatment and recovery. We believe in growth. It's true that psychosis is underrepresented in the media, but our community is very represented. Our community is made up of students coming from diverse backgrounds, regions, and identities. Our goals here as Students with Psychosis aims to expand mental health, brain health advocacy at the college level to ensure psychosis representation, including a global perspective. Too often is psychosis left out of brain health of, and mental health conversation on college campuses. And our narrative is often limited, excluding intersectional community members. Our primary objectives include growing and connecting our virtual and in-person programs, organizing outreach initiatives and founding in-person college clubs, affiliates and hubs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dominique, for sharing with us. And let me just say, when you stepped into the intern coordinator position, you really was a, a pivotal team member there and such a powerhouse. Thank you so much for your leadership with SWP behind the scenes and sharing with us today. All right, next up, we're going to be hearing from our student leader coordinator, Alice. Alice, the floor is yours. Hi y'all, I'm Alice. My pronouns are they, she. I'm 23 years old. I serve as the student leader coordinator for students with psychosis, and I have atypical schizophrenia, among other disorders. When I first told my father I was diagnosed with an unspecified psychotic disorder, his response was, I'm not really sure what that means, sweetheart. This was a defining moment in my experience as someone with a psychotic disorder, as it dawned on me just how little the average person knows about psychosis. In high school, I was told by a boyfriend that I shouldn't share my experiences with anyone else to avoid making people uncomfortable. In many therapy sessions, I have been asked if I ever want to be symptom-free of my psychosis, a question that wounds me to hear, as I view my disorder as a part of me that I will never be free from. For me, coping means accepting that my disorders are a part of who I am, atypical schizophrenia, depression, fibromyalgia. They're all just as much a part of me as my creativity, my bravery, and my ability to love. Love is an important step to anyone's healing journey, 
whether it be romantic or platonic. And people with psychosis often experience discrimination when it comes to romance. According to Frontiers in Psychology, 27% of relationship survey respondents with schizophrenia experience discrimination in romantic relationships and sexual relationships. And 55% of them anticipated this kind of discrimination. It's not only love from others that people with psychosis struggle with, but love from themselves. A serious problem lies also in the self-stigmatization of this group, which leads to low self-esteem and isolation. Students with psychosis at the time of my joining was known as students with schizophrenia. I found the organization through Cecilia's TED Talk while doing a research project on psychosis and consent in 2019. I struggled with symptoms of schizophrenia since childhood. However, I wasn't diagnosed as psychotic until 2018 and didn't have a diagnosis of atypical schizophrenia until last year. When I found SWP, it created an environment where I, first as an intern, then a student leader, and now a staff member, could express my symptoms without judgment of my functionality. As our executive board member Bailey said during a recent MHA lecture, people start to heal when they feel heard. I felt heard by SWP because I was never judged by what I could or could not do. I've heard the term high functioning since eighth grade when I was diagnosed with depression. It is a term that has haunted and invalidated me for my entire mental health journey. 70 to 90% of people with schizophrenia are unemployed and more than half of people with schizophrenia have at least one comorbid diagnosis influencing their ability to function. High functioning is loosely defined as the ability to carry out one's daily tasks by an article from Very Well Mind. Tasks like brushing your teeth, walking your dog, going to work or school, and exercising regularly. Every day, I have a fight in the bathroom. It takes so many spoons for me to brush my teeth that I have broken down in tears trying to gather the strength to open my toothbrush case. However, I am perceived as extremely high functioning by mental health care providers because I take online classes, I maintain a social life, and I've had jobs. This may be more than some, but it never feels like enough for me because I see the small tasks that I struggle with every day of my life. I notice when I skip brushing my teeth or don't shower for a few days or make my bed once a week at best. Due to this label of high function, I'm afraid to apply for disability or ask for any form of support when I need it. This is despite the fact that 64% of people with schizophrenia were viewed as highly disabled in a 2006 study in the Indian Journal of Psychiatry. Schizophrenia was actually labeled as maximally disabling, and the only disorder of the seven that was studied with a higher disability percentage was dementia. Despite this, about a quarter of people with psychosis who apply for disability aid are rejected. What I'm trying to say is psychosis and mental illness look a little different on everyone. Terms like high functioning and symptom-free living take away from the invisible daily struggles and battles we all face. You can't have the understanding of the lived experience until you live it. But if you never do, you can at least listen to those who fight these battles. Bring the voices of people with psychosis to your media, to your conferences, and to your mental health professionals. Thank you for letting us bring our voice to your lecture series. Thank you, Alice. Very, very powerfully said. And Alice, you, again, I just wanted to uh, mention that you are our student leader coordinator. And we, uh, we very endearingly refer to you also as our Discord wizard when it comes to helping us with our online programming. Thank you again, Alice, for so much of your leadership behind the scenes. All right, up next, we have Emeka Chima. Emeka is our secretary on our executive board and a dear friend. Emeka, take it away. Thank you, Cecilia. And thank you, everybody who came before me. Uh, greetings to all. My name is Emeka Chima, he, him pronouns, and I'm logging in from Gaithersburg, Maryland. My role as students with psychosis is executive board secretary and I very much welcome you all for today's lecture featuring my fellow speakers. How would you respond if you were told you had a family history of severe mental illness? Personally, this changed my whole outlook on psychosis. Before I knew it, my late grandfather and my aunt were both diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I was soon discovered their selfless sacrifices as they dealt with schizophrenia 
and later on depression. The future awaits a world where illness is synonymous with health and recovery for a better life and a better relationship with loved ones. Around the time I was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, I also faced a mild case of depression. Living with these chronic illnesses meant recovery was no easy feat. Depression caused me bouts of fatigue, lack of motivation, disruptive sleep, insecurities, and low self-esteem. On the other hand, schizophrenia had created my mind into a simulation of hallucinations and delusions. Everything I had experienced was life-changing and transformative. Here at Students with Psychosis, we welcome these experiences for greater insight and encourage others to open up about their own life-changing experiences. I consider myself a black indigenous person of color. I was raised by a Nigerian father and a mother from Washington, DC. Whenever I face barriers in mental health and life in general, I lean on my guardians for support. Following my diagnosis, I began to perceive how interdependent my mental health was with my family heritage. I had developed a newfound relationship with my own identity. We can cultivate connections when we are looking for support and redemption. The year 2020 was definitely filled with many twists and turns due to the massive COVID-19 outbreak, which took a toll on my mental health. The COVID-19 pandemic has awakened me to a not so distant past, where there was much uncertainty and internal stigma. This reminds me of when I was diagnosed with autism at age 10 and faced the onset of schizophrenia and depression at age 15. There was isolation, especially for my conventional support system, who seemed to be more occupied than accessible. There were shortages of medication, which became too scarce due to higher demand and short supply. There were symptoms, which seemed to stem from a future, fear of a future that will never truly understand my mental illness. That is until I discovered my place at Students for Psychosis. Years after being on a search, for an answer. April 2020 was quite the milestone. It was the first time the nonprofit organization Students for Psychosis witnessed its biggest growth by 40% in its members. It was not a coincidence when I became actively involved as a student leader, going on sec sec executive board secretary for SWP. This positively impacted my life with new connections and new opportunities along the way. At this foundation, SWP represents an initiative that has strived on diversity where the rest of the world has been divided. While the pandemic that, that caused a great deal of physical, mental, and emotional stresses and strains, SWP has been able to thrive on personal, in community engagement, hope, recovery, and second chances. Together, we have been able to, to engage in spearheading virtual and in-person meetups, as well as making new discoveries. Students with Psychosis has given me a platform of belonging, acceptance, and inclusivity, with not only a centralized community, but also one that is very personalized to learn to create and to interact. Our hope is to foster an organization with these outstanding qualities for all joining members, shedding a positive light on mental illness in the face of adversity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emeka. Such a good delivery there when it came to your presentation. And also, I just want to add as well, uh, like as Emeka mentioned, they joined SWP in 2020. So I first met Emeka virtually through our virtual programming. But then on our first meetup, you can't really tell via like Zoom, but Emeka is really tall. So I looked up to you, Emeka, 
before, like in the virtual programming, but when I met you in person, looked up to you in a very different sense. Thank you again, Emeka, for sharing. All right, last but definitely not least, we're going to be hearing from Laura. Laura is our, uh, our VP of management on our executive board. Laura, take it away. Thanks, Cecilia. Um, I'm Laura, logging in from New York, and my preferred pronouns are she and her. I have a master's in library and information science from SUNY Albany, and I'm currently a library aide in a public library. I'll be talking a little bit about accessibility and inclusivity in the workplace at SWP and my experience serving as VP management on the executive board there. My experience with students with psychosis started when I applied to be a student leader and advocate as I was finishing graduate school. It was a great way to end my program while receiving a master's in science that SWP recognized at my virtual graduation party with them in 2020. Since my original graduation was canceled because of the pandemic, it was so nice to have an official graduation celebration with fellow peers and advocates. Upon graduating, I found it difficult finding any library jobs that I went to school for since it was the pandemic. So I continued working part-time in human services, helping people with disabilities and the elderly was an essential worker. Eventually, when things started to pick up again from COVID, I obtained a part-time job in a public library as a library aide behind the reference desk that I'm currently working in. How Students with Psychosis models its workplace is how I would like to see my own personal work environment operate. A job that reflects its ethics and morale of inclusivity and accessibility creates less symptoms while at work. Having coping skills so I can function on a professional level is important so I can fulfill the job requirements. I pursued working in libraries because they are safe spaces for me and SWP reflects that in their workspace too. There is an emphasis not to put all the workload on one person, but rather we use everyone involved to participate and problem solve. So this creates a team-based atmosphere. SWP is accessible to students worldwide, serving a global audience and making it inclusive to people who live in Asia, Africa, North America, South America, Europe, and Australia and Oceania. We are accommodating to student needs so they can have the ability to participate in diverse programming if they want to. Whether or not someone is having a good or bad day shouldn't interfere with the person's daily activities, such as also attending school or work. The meetings are a place where we can share our highs and lows of the day to communicate more, which psychosis can prevent me doing. The organization teaches effective time management skills that can sometimes get lost because of the nature of the disorder. I have experienced the feeling of time being warped due to psychosis that made it difficult to keep track of time. The schedule offers students a routine to follow and more structures in their lives if they feel they may need that because of their psychosis creating barriers to time management. We give valuable advice on coping mechanisms and how to obtain future goals while living with psychosis. I sometimes feel that because of the stigma of psychosis, I cannot pursue a goal of mine to work as an official librarian in the future. The feelings of shame, isolation, and also side effects from my medications cause obstacles for me. The organization has given me more confidence in the workplace because at SWP, we can work together without judgment. I believe this morale can coexist in outside work environments by bringing more advocacy and awareness into the workplace as employees with disabilities. As VP management, I can better advocate for myself in a work setting like SWP. The role I'm in has prepared me to be in a leadership position that can be a requirement in many school and work settings. The collaboration and coordination on the executive board has formed many friendships amongst each other as peers and colleagues who all respect one another. The programming such as creative meetings allows me to showcase my creative works in photography and writing, which was inspired by students with psychosis and their advocacy. I use mental health themes in my creative works that help me process psychosis better. I greatly appreciate that the organization brought out my artistic sides for self-expression. Thank you so much for your time and listening to my story. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Laura, for sharing your experience with us today. I want to again thank all of those that have shared today. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Amaka. Thank you, Laura, for sharing. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about uh, students with psychosis, what we do, and how to get more involved. So we've been talking a bit about our virtual programming with students with psychosis. I am very proud that throughout the pandemic and continuing on today, we offer four to five hours every single day of facilitated programming for our students and advocates at no cost. And we have a variety of different types of these virtual programmings based on the comfortability of those who wanna participate. For example, Every day we have a, at midnight to 1 a.m. to noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we have a live text chat for our students that just wanna talk text based and check in on each other. Also every morning at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, we all have an audio hangout where our students can uh, tune in and get to connect with their fellow peers. We call this sort of like a group phone call with your best friends. Also, we have more structured virtual programming every day, such as our peer support group meetings, our creative meetings, our guest speaker series, our community groups, our community meetings, and game nights and discussion groups. There are so many ways to get more involved with SWP, even as a student and student as a student, you can get involved. Also as an advocate, you can get more involved in leadership positions behind the scenes. You can become a brand ambassador, a community group leader, an event coordinator, join our internship program or our advocacy network. Also, SWP is expanding. We are also opening up different membership tiers for those who wanna get involved, even if you don't come from the lived experience perspective. For example, we are opening up the friends and family membership, the student advocate uh, uh, membership for those that are in a mental health related uh, major or psychology. We also have a creative membership for those creatives. And also we have a membership tier for mental health professionals. It's important for us to work together to help with psychosis advocacy. I wanna thank the free lecture for giving us the opportunity to present today. When you empower people living with psychosis, you empower one of the most misunderstood and vulnerable communities today, while also tackling some of the most prevalent concerns of our community as well. Since community members living with psychosis often have that overlap with those that struggle with housing insecurities, food insecurities, the dropout rate from college, uh, unemployment. These are all concerns that we should be talking about more. And by involving people living with psychosis in leadership positions and empowering our voices, we can help tackle these issues together. Thank you again for having us here today and for sharing our stories. Thank you for giving the lived experience a voice. Thank you. And so thank you, SWP, Cecilia, Ray, Dominique, Alice, Emeka, and Laura for that awesome and informative presentation.